Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and a very, very warm welcome to all of you once again to HIRE's weekly webinar. We're very excited to have you back again this week for a very special interactive session this time. And we're having with us today two very, very interesting and very, very uh, innovative educators on our panel who are going to be talking to you and taking you through and interacting with you about how to make your own classrooms more interactive. To those of you who are here for the first time, welcome to Hire. My name is Pallavi Devedi and I'm the founder of Hire. To those of you who've been here before, thank you so much for your continued support and participation. We love having you with us, answering all your questions, um, coming up with interesting ways in which we can continue to support you. So keep that participation and that enthusiasm going. I'm going to get us started very quickly with uh, this evening's session uh, by talking a little bit about um, our housekeeping rules. Uh, today's session is particularly uh, going to be focused on interaction. Therefore, rightly as one would expect, it's also an interactive session. Uh, while the panelists won't be able to see you and we won't be using the raise your hand feature, we will be asking you to do some interesting activities as the session goes along. Um, to do that, our participants are requested to log in to the Seesaw app. Uh, and you will be receiving uh, the Seesaw app link in the chat just as we speak right now. Um, you're, you're requested to keep the Seesaw app open and running. We will be asking you to sign in uh, when the panelist is ready with their activity. Uh, in, the, in the session today, we had asked all of you participants to submit a few questions in advance, which we will be putting out during the session and our panelists will be answering those questions in addition to the ones that you will ask in the session today. So do keep your questions coming in in the Q&A box. Uh, do keep your general observations and your thoughts coming through in the chat. Uh, we'd love to keep hearing from you and uh, we'd love for you to exchange change ideas and talk to one another. But at the same time, we request you to be mindful uh, and to be discreet in your interactions with others and extend all the necessary kindness and courtesies. As always, webinar recordings and PPTs will be made available to all participants. They'll be sent out via email. They'll also be available on our YouTube channel as well as on our website. And as all of you do expect, we offer certificates for our webinars and if you'd like a certificate for this week's webinar, you can send in your submissions to what you learned in today's session, either via a sketch note or via a classroom activity uh, idea that you were inspired to design after listening to the panelists today, or via a 150 word reflection on one idea or activity that you found most interesting or didn't find interesting at all, and would like to, uh, to share with us why not, or how you do something differently as well. So we're open to any and all of those uh, ideas coming in from you. Do send in these entries by six o'clock tomorrow, Saturday, 6 p.m. India time. We'll be sharing the link for the Google form with you right at the end of the session. And it'll also pop up for those of you who, uh, when you exit the session as well. Uh, sharing with you this week's hires super contributors, to those of you who are unfamiliar with what super contributors are, these are some of the most amazing entries that we've received from last week's webinar. Uh, uh, teachers who submitted responses for the certificate and have been chosen as some of the most interesting activities or reflections that stood out to us uh, when we were reviewing them. So congratulations to this week's super contributors, to Sushweta Saha from the Meridian School in Hyderabad, to Avinash Kumar from the Khetan Public School, Saibabad, uh, and Tatiana Kadzurova from Lancers International School, Gurugram. These are some of the amazing activities that they put out. They're also available for you all to be able to go and see on our social media channels. So Sweta had a beautiful reflection on service learning, how she, this is a part of um, what she submitted as her reflection. And she talks about how starting early and starting small is at the heart of her approach to community action and service learning. Um, Avinash sent in a wonderful activity, which actually is a transdisciplinary activities going across social sciences, languages, 
uh, and maths uh, in order for students to understand human resources and how those impact social issues and the country at large. And of course, a beautiful sketch note sent in to us by Tatiana. So congratulations participants for uh, being this week's super contributors and we look forward to receiving all your responses for this week's webinar in our inbox tomorrow. All right, on to today's session, which is focusing on creating interactive classrooms with technology. How can we design classroom activities, classroom resources and aids, which promote maximum student participation and interaction? And we know that in the last few months since classes have gone remote, this has become particularly challenging. How do we do this for students who are online? And once school reopen or when we move into hybrid mode, how do we ensure that students continue talking to us, continue responding to all the knowledge that we're sharing with them, interacting with that knowledge, formulating their opinions and ideas, sharing that with the rest of the class, because we know that that's probably the best way in which kids learn and, and for us uh, to be able to assess what they're learning as well. So as always, hires big four of quality teaching, very quickly sharing that with you to tell you what today's our webinar is going to be focused on. Um, every week, everything that we do is focused on one of these four broad domains, which we feel are the most crucial when it comes to uh, designing classroom practices. Either we're looking at planning for classroom delivery or designing instruction or managing student progress or practicing professionalism. And today's session is looking at how do we go ahead and plan these different activities? What sort of tech tools should we use and how do we go about using them? So uh, before I, uh, before taking up any more time, I'd like to introduce today's panelist to all of you. Uh, please join me in welcoming Tracy Pilts. Tracy is joining us all the way from Montana, USA. She's a blogger and an award-winning educator teaching at Billings Public School. She's a technology integration specialist for K-2 grades and will be taking all your questions today about how do you promote interaction for your tiny tots. Uh, second, Panelist for this evening is Sanchita Ghosh. Sanchita is the head of department history at Sanskriti School, New Delhi. She's also a technology support teacher uh, and is a uh, Google for Education certified trainer and is also a part of the Google Educator Group for New Delhi. So welcome panelists and thank you so much for being with us today. I'm now going to invite our first panelist for today's uh, discussion, Tracy. Uh, Tracy, if I could open up the floor to you and ask you to come in and uh, take over the discussion. So over to you, Tracy. Hello. Um, it's it's bright and early in the morning for me. So um, I, I was going to say good morning, <laughs> uh, but I'm so happy to be here. I'm going to go ahead and uh, get my screen shared so that we can begin. Um, but just thrilled um, to be here. Uh, joining you all today and just kind of sharing this is um, one of my favorite topics is just how to use technology to create these really interactive engaging lessons for our, our young learners. Uh, my teaching experience I spent um, over 12 years in a kindergarten classroom and now I work with um, teachers in our district helping them integrate technology in their own classrooms. And most recently, I actually was, um, the for the past several months, I've been teaching first grade online. Um, so we've been doing some remote things as well. So um, I'd love to just chat for a few minutes about what those interactive and transformational um, experiences are. And then um, we're gonna dive into Seesaw a little bit. So if you have, um, already have a Seesaw account, maybe you have that open in another tab, um, perhaps you have it downloaded on a, a mobile device. Um, if you don't have an account, that link was provided to you in the chat. It's really quick and easy to set up a free teacher account. So I'd encourage you to take these few minutes while I'm visiting um, to go ahead and get logged in to Seesaw or set up a, a teacher account really quickly so that you have some time to play um, and, and experience Seesaw a little bit as we talk. So I'm gonna pose a question to you and I'd love for you to, to think about that question and then put your response into the chat 
box so that we can learn from one another. But in your mind, what makes for a transformational learning experience for your students? So go ahead and think about that. And then I'm going to jump over here to the um, the chat box. And if you have ideas, um, go ahead and put them there. What makes for that transformational learning experience for our students? I'd love to hear your ideas. Classrooms to computers. Um, a good understanding of content by using various tools and using technology and activities that are at for it. Absolutely, I like um, that you said that because not everything that we do in our classrooms is better using technology. And so finding um, those activities and experiences that we can adapt to using technology that makes it even better. I love that. Um, I think technology can help us develop um, that engagement and really help motivate our students um, and develop that love for learning. I love um, connecting with the real world effectively. Um, these opportunities to reach outside, we had a wonderful discussion as uh, when we met this morning before um, the session began about how, you know, walls have been completely broken down now, right? The fact that I'm able to join you from Montana um, is just, just mind boggling. It's amazing. And so uh, um, connecting with the real world and giving them those types of experiences. Absolutely. Um, go ahead and keep putting those in there if you'd like. I'm going to continue. Um, but research shows that students learn best when they're actively engaged in constructing and reflecting on their learning. So um, we, we know that when students get to, you know, um, touch things, talk about things, explain their thinking, we know that they learn better that way. And so giving them those opportunities, whether they're in a classroom with us physically or whether we're teaching them remotely, um, these the same research is true. So developing these types of experiences for them where they can um, engage, have choice, reflect on what they're doing is so incredibly important. Um, we use, like, like I said, I've been um, supporting teachers here in my district with tech integration, I work mostly with our kindergarten through third grade teachers and students. Um, and I've been doing that for the past six years. And, and a model that we use often is the SAMR model. I don't know if this is um, something that you're familiar with. A lot of our teachers hadn't heard of it, even though they're doing a lot of these things, they, they didn't have a name for it. But this is an idea that was developed um, by Ruben Puntadera um, in, in 2010. And it's just a scaffold or a framework for how we're um, incorporating technology into our classrooms. And I, I really loved putting this framework as I began using technology in my classroom. Um, I really liked being able to put it into this framework. So the idea here, um, and sometimes it's a ladder, sometimes it's a circle, but the idea is we're starting at one, one spot. So substitution would be that beginning space. So perhaps I start using technology by taking a, a worksheet that I had, and I'm going to pull that into um, maybe make it a Google Doc or maybe bring it into Seesaw so that my students can respond digitally. I haven't really changed what I'm asking them to do. There are a lot of benefits to that. I think we have to go through those first steps. If I haven't done that piece um, as a teacher and learned how to do that, it's going to be difficult for me to um, modify in other ways. So I think there's important steps there for our students to be able to learn, okay, I'm just going to add a text box or I'm going to write on, um, on my iPad or on my Chromebook. Um, so we substitute but we haven't really changed the task. As we move along this SAMR um, ladder or circle, we're consciously aware that we're trying to um, continue to create activities that kind of redefine what we're able to do in our classroom. So as we move up this model, we're augmenting, we're modifying. And the last piece there is redefinition, where technology allows for the creation of new tasks that were previously inconceivable. So I'm now asking my students to do things 
that they couldn't have done 10 years ago before they had this technology in their hands. Um, incorporating video, incorporating audio, creating media. These are things we're doing with young learners, giving them that opportunity to share their learning, be actively involved with their learning. Um, and so I think this is a wonderful framework. Um, one thing I will say, because I think I thought, okay, well, I did an activity, you know, I substituted and now I'm, I'm moving up this ladder and I did this really amazing activity. That doesn't mean that everything I do from then on is all of a sudden going to be at that redefinition level. Then maybe tomorrow when I plan my math lesson, I have to kind of start from square one because I'm, I'm building my, my way up um, into that redefinition zone. Maybe I'm just going to augment or modify tomorrow. And so I really do think it's a continuous cycle, but just to always be thinking, how can I add more to what I'm asking my students to do that's going to allow for that redefinition and really allow them to share um, in, in ways that they haven't before. So when we were talking about this session and really wanted um, participants to be able to interact, I really wanted to hone in on one particular tool so that you would be able to interact with this tool. Um, my number one tool, the one that I always start with um, when I'm asked to um, help our teachers uh, get started with using technology is always Seesaw. The reason is it really is a hub, a kind of a one-stop shop. There are so many tools embedded within Seesaw it's also a space where students can um, store their learning, they can share their learning, they can reflect on their learning, and I as a teacher can communicate all of this with, um, with parents. So this is really always my, <clears throat> my first um, tool that I share with the K through two or K through three teachers that I work with. So I'd love for you to spend a few minutes um, just kind of exploring while you're exploring. I'm going to just kind of get into my Seesaw class and just demonstrate quickly. Um, within Seesaw, there are so many tools that will allow you to create an interactive activity where students can be engaging and using all of those Seesaw creative tools to share their thinking and learning. So if you'd like to play along, open your, um, your mobile app or go to app.seesaw.me log in or create your free account and we're going to go into activities so you're going to click on that big green plus sign and choose assign activity the seesaw creative tools this is just a little slide to kind of give you an overview because of course we won't have a time to do all of these things um, in these next few minutes but just so you have an idea what you can add to create these activities for your students and then what tools they have access to to be able to respond. Um, I put great big and bold over on the side the camera and the video. <clears throat> Being able to take pictures of what they're doing, talk about what they're doing, make a quick video to explain what they're doing. I mean, to me, this is incredibly powerful, um, whether I'm in the classroom with them, because if I'm in the classroom, there's a bunch of them and there's only one of me. And so to be able to then go back and look at this information um, later and really hear my students thinking is so powerful. And as I've been teaching remotely, I would have been absolutely completely lost without this tool. This is how I know know what my students are thinking, what they're doing. Um, so I'm just going to pop really quickly over into my Seesaw class. I'm clicking on that plus sign and I sign activity. There is a whole community library of activities that you can search that are ready for you. Seesaw ambassadors like myself have created activities. They're here, they're free. You can click on them and use them. They're amazing. If you're wanting to start from scratch and create your own, you're in my library and you're gonna click create new activity. You're going to um, fill in, and I'm going to leave this part for now, but you would type in your instructions, really great step-by-step -step instructions. You can put little visual icons in here. You can add voice instructions. I can give them something, an example, a, a demonstration, a mini lesson, something I want them to read first. And then my template is here. Here's how I want my students to respond. When I get into my template, I love that I can add some features in here. I could open up um, this video tool. I could record a quick video to them right here, explaining to them what I would like them to do. 
Um, I can add as shapes. Seesaw has all of these shapes. I noticed a lot of you in the questions were asking ways to use technology for math. Um, I love Seesaw for math. I love that we have these base 10 blocks. I love that there's the pattern blocks in here. I could be um, creating a problem where I want students to explain their thinking. They could click on this microphone right here. Students can be explaining what what number they're making. They could be moving these items around. They could be um, drawing on the board. I have 110 more. So altogether I have 110. They could be doing all of those things at once, creating a video for me that again, I as a teacher can watch. I can see them moving around. I can see them explaining. Um, to me what they're doing. And so I just think there's so many powerful tools in here. I also love uploading. I use this for a lot of um, sort of drag and drop activities. So students can be manipulating items. Um, if I want to do that, I have um, lots of, we got a bunch of snow here in Billings. And so I'm kind of on a, a winter kick right now, even though really it's fall, but I have some um, clip art. Perhaps I want them to sort things. Maybe I'm doing beginning sounds, maybe I'm going to do a, a math activity. I can bring in pieces of clip art that then my students can move around. You'll see how this would be movable. And again, they can be interacting, manipulating, moving these items, and then also um, explaining, talking, adding, um, adding their thoughts and reflections on top of here. Um, I will, when I'm done talking, I'll be sure to drop a link into the chat box um, where I have a more in-depth video. So if you're wanting to learn a little bit more about building these activities, um, I'm happy to share that with you as well. But I just wanted you to get a little taste of how you can come into Seesaw and really create these rich interactive experiences that again, your students can be um, touching and moving and talking. And then also just to really look at these tools that they have access to here and see that these are all the ways that you can construct your lessons or activities, but all the ways that they also um, can share their thinking and learning back to you. So if they could draw, they could draw. You know, if they want to upload a, a paper that they typed, they could do that as well. Um, I'll go quickly through this last little piece here, um, but more favorite engagement tools for K3. Like I said, Seesaw is my number one because Anything we make in any of these other spaces can then be shared to Seesaw. So they have a space to keep them, share, reflect. Um, but these are just kind of a list of my other favorite tools. Um, when you get these slides, all of these are clickable. So all of these different tools you can click on and explore and learn more. Um, I know one of the questions in the, in the uh, question bank that came up was how do I keep them engaged during a Zoom? Um, and some of these are a great option for that class kick is something that you can use and see what they're doing in real time. Class kick I used with my remote first graders for math all the time because I could put our activity into class kick and then we could be on the Zoom and I could be watching what they were doing in real time on class kick and then provide them feedback in real time. So class kick remote math to me was an absolute must. Um, and then lots of other tools here that you can click on and explore. Um, this last slide here, um, again, just has my contact information. Please, you're welcome to reach out at any time. And then I do a um, newsletter each week. I put the link in here so that you can come and find um, the archives of this, but there's always tips for um, teachers of young students, tips for utilizing technology in their classrooms, as well as my blog and some Wakelet collections. I don't know if you're familiar with Wakelet, but these Wakelet collections, I've put together um, lots of different topics as far as, you know, here's some math apps, here's some um, great activities and protocols with video meetings for your class. I know that was something that a lot of you asked. So um, again, just a, a huge collection here of um, tools and tips that may be useful to you. That's wonderful, Tracy. Thank you so much. Suddenly, I wish I was teaching primary school all over again. Um, <laughs> 
it sounds like so much fun and uh, there are some amazing uh, tools that you talked about and and uh, of course um, seesaw is a fantastic tool somebody was asking also in the chat if they can use seesaw with middle schoolers and you most certainly can um, i used to use seesaw mostly with middle schoolers uh, they it's not as if you know you can only just um, do all of these little clip party things for the primary school kids you can also use slightly more um, mature resources for older students you can add links you can add videos just like tracy uh, just showed you um, somebody was also asking about how is it that we can use seesaw for science so tracy if you might if you would like to ask um, uh, answer that question Oh, absolutely. Um, again, it's applicable to every grade level. And just when you look at those tools that are there, you can see how perfectly it would pair with science to be able to um, take a video of a lab and then look back and reflect or, um, you know, use the, the drawing tool even to do some quick notes or sketching out. Um, so absolutely, this would pair perfectly with science, just using those creative tools to let your students share what they're thinking and learning. Absolutely. So now I'm going to very quickly take a couple of questions that have come in. And these are some of the questions that participants who registered earlier asked us. Um, so the first one is that uh, we do, we, um, you know, classes now are only about, um, they're about 30 minutes shorter or they are in, if not specifically 30 minutes, but definitely shorter than what some of the uh, in-person classes used to be. Um, what advice would you give to teachers uh, to incorporate interaction uh, without having to rush through all the content, giving kids enough time to, you know, actually play around with these tools and utilize them to the fullest? I really think, um, so how we are teaching here is the same. We had kind of short, and I'm teaching primary, I'm teaching first grade, but we have short, you know, probably 20 to 30 minute Zoom sessions, which of course is much shorter than our normal class day. So I really tried to pull out what was important to discuss um, or even just fun things to be able to build those relationships and have fun together when we were meeting um, live synchronously, like in our Zoom, and then continue that by creating those, um, some of those interactive activities in, you know, maybe Seesaw or Classkick or Google Classroom, whatever tool you're using, um, but have that learning continue. So it doesn't all have to happen when you're there together live. You can begin that discussion or that activity, and then they would move to the, the tool or the program to actually um, continue to interact and share with you their thinking and learning. Yeah, and they can continue to do this asynchronously as well. And even when we go move into um, our regular school lessons, um, a, a lot of this stuff can be built into things that you know children can continue working on even at home uh, and come back uh, with their answers, which we can then discuss as a class group together. Uh, so of course, um, uh, the second question uh, that I wanted to uh, bring up, which is coming in from our uh, live chat just now, um, is about how is is it that we can use Seesaw to play pre-recorded videos? Is there an option to do that, uh, Tracy? I know you showed something about videos, yeah. but was this only for um, exporting YouTube videos or can a teacher record a video of their own and then upload it onto Seesaw? Good question. Yep. So within Seesaw itself, um, you can record right in Seesaw for up to five minutes. So that's kind of nice. It sometimes helps me be really concise. There's an upload tool and a link tool. So if you've pre-recorded a video using some another tool, um, you can upload it directly to Seesaw. I think it has to be under 250 megabytes or like what I do, I use Screencastify. And so it creates a, a link to my Google Drive or I could put it in YouTube. I typically take my pre-recorded videos and then I generate a link and add it to Seesaw using the link. Right, absolutely. That's fantastic. So thank you so much for all those wonderful tools that you talked about and thank you for guiding us uh, through Seesaw, Tracy. That was absolutely fantastic. I'm now gonna bring uh, our next panelist, um, Sanchita. Uh, to talk to us about HyperDocs and what she's been doing with students in her classrooms 
in secondary school. So Sanjita, we, we've already uh, got quite a few questions about how do we build interaction for older students. Uh, so over to you to take on, take us through uh, what we can, well, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. So over to you yeah. to uh, take us through what you've been doing for interactive classrooms. Yeah. So uh, hello everyone. And I should say good morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening, because I can see in the chat box that we've been uh, joined by educators from across time zone. So that's exciting. And, uh, you know, just before we were opening our live session, we actually had this quick discussion on uh, how, um, you know, we, we are living in very exciting times. Uh, who would have thought that we'd, we'd have uh, panelists from across the world, participants from across the world, uh, you know, on a common platform talking to each other without having to worry about uh, travel arrangements, stay arrangements, um, and, you know, whether we'll be able to make it there on time and so on. Uh, and I know many of you who would have just had their lunch and, uh, you know, are kind of relaxing and yet you've made time to join us. Uh, Tracy, it's uh, very early morning for you. So thank you so much for that as well. Um, and yeah, and, um, you know, when we talk about this interactivity and I can see what's going on in the chat box as well. So that is, I think, one of the most powerful ways uh, you can interact with your students uh, in an online mode when you're synchronously uh, interfacing uh, with them, right? So uh, make use of the chat box. I think that's one of the most powerful interactive tools. Uh, there is zero prep uh, required for that. Uh, the moment you know you're kind of going in your flow and you've been discussing a particularly uh, difficult concept, and you can just stop there for a moment and uh, put a short question across to them and say, "Okay, now put that in in the chat box and let's hear from you." Um, so that's your zero prep. I mean, you don't need any uh, special software, uh, any any uh, you know time that you would have uh, otherwise. Uh, you know, you'd be spending at least half an hour thinking up, putting them together in a particular document, pushing it out or an app and so on. So uh, the first thing I always recommend uh, is use the chat box to its fullest. So whether you're using Zoom, whether you're using uh, Google Meet or uh, Microsoft Teams or any other uh, video interface, um, you know, uh, just encourage your students uh, occasionally uh, just to do a quick check that have they been listening to you, right? Um, like uh, a lot of the questions which came in did say that you know, when we have a 40 minute class or a 45 minute class, a lot of children tend to and it's it's natural. I mean, I would often lose uh, uh, track if, if I, uh, you know, if I'm tired or I, you know, the teacher's just droning on. So I'm not going to drone on anymore. And I'm going to share my screen with you. And we can um, start off for the uh, for my bit of the session. I, I hope my screen is uh, visible now. Yes, it is. Yeah, great. Um, so Dave Burgess is one of uh, the rock star, um, you know, ed techers out there, um, a, a very, very popular, very famous. Uh, and there are a lot of educators and Tracy is one of them, of course. Um, and there are a lot of educators out there who've inspired me to uh, relook at how I, uh, how I was teaching and uh, look at how ed tech can be integrated into your day to day teaching. So Ed tech integration should not become a festival. Uh, you know, once in a blue moon, I plan for a whole month and then we do one ed tech activity. It can be done on a daily basis, whether we are in a face-to-face -face, uh, situation with the students at a common venue, uh, whether we are uh, so, uh, you know, interacting with them in, in a synchronous uh, online manner, or even if we are uh, you know, in an asynchronous uh, setup where you've set up certain activities for them, set up certain learning uh, packets for them and uh, the uh, students can then uh, take that forward. Uh, so I love this um, uh, quote from uh, Dave Burgess when he said, if you provide an uncommon experience for your students, they will reward you with an uncommon effort and attitude. And, you know, I'm a living example of this. Um, you know, I tend to get these crazy ideas sometimes uh, and I, I share them with my students. Uh, I, I teach high school. Um, uh, so, uh, you know, the students can take things uh, uh, for, further in a, uh, in a much more uh, independent manner than the younger ones who will need that much more scaffolding. Uh, but, uh, you know, if I just shared my ideas with them, um, initially, there'll be a couple of them who wouldn't really know what, you know, I'm getting at and, you know, ma'am's gone crazy again. Um, but when we talk about this a little more, we think about how we could do things differently. Uh, and I can see them getting excited and they have, yes, and they've rewarded me with some amazing work that they've done. And I'm so proud of my students. And my next step, what we are planning for now over the next uh, three months um, is, uh, you know, trying to do a virtual um, uh, gallery walk and for a much wider audience, not just for the school audience, but we're trying to open it up for the rest of the world. And, you know, hopefully if you and I keep in touch, uh, 
you know, I will be sharing out uh, links so that we can, uh, you know, my students can get a wider audience, uh, more questions and uh, which will push them even harder, um, you know, to, to excel in their chosen fields. Uh, so as I say, uh, you know, you give them that bit of opportunity and they will surprise you and they will wow you with their off the charts uh, performance. Uh, so, uh, you know, when I was just talking to Pallavi, um, when, when we were planning for this session, uh, she was very uh, excited about the Bitmoji classroom. Um, the Bitmoji classroom had been around for a little while, but I think once we moved into the online environment, it kind of became, a, a, you know, a, a way to kind of set the agenda for the, for the students. Uh, Bitmoji classroom, it sounds very really complicated, but it's very easy to create. I've just used uh, Google Slides for this. All I've done, I've pulled in uh, some uh, clip art images uh, by running uh, image searches uh, from within Google Slides. Um, and this, of course, is uh, my Bitmoji. Bitmojis are very easy to create. Uh, all you need to do is uh, either have the Bitmoji app on your phone, or if you're on a computer, you can just add this uh, Chrome extension to your Chrome browser, and you're good to go. And you can choose your appearance. So I, I've been going gray these uh, this past uh, year and a half. And um, so I kind of, uh, I, I couldn't find any, any of that with, with had, which had salt and pepper hair. So this was the closest I could get. Uh, so you can select, uh, you know, um, your physical appearance, clothing, and uh, then uh, the Bitmoji extension on the Bitmoji app creates, uh, you know, all of these, uh, uh, you know, little uh, Bitmoji images for you to use uh, wherever you want them to, uh, to want to put them. So I've got this little learning from home uh, Bitmoji right there. Uh, this, um, uh, uh, Blackboard also, I just, this was an image and I just, what I did was I just put in a text box here and I typed in my stuff. I put in uh, two um, links as well. We'll just go into them in a while. Um, since we're all at home, uh, many of uh, my students uh, uh, have pets. I don't have a pet right now because um, I, I really uh, wasn't sure I was up for the responsibility, but it always helps to have this little animal in a corner. Uh, and uh, if you have younger children, whether they're primary or middle school, they do tend to get a little excited about, you know, is this a glimpse of uh, the teacher's home? Um, so you can set up in any which way you want. These are all individual separate images. So the bookshelf was separate. Uh, the chair uh, is separate. So is the side uh, table here, the cat, the rug, the plant. All of these are just separate images and you can just put them together. And, uh, you know, you can have a nice, uh, happy looking room. Uh, but uh, the other side of it uh, also is uh, um, don't crowd your uh, Bitmoji classroom with uh, too many things uh, because we are reaching out to all kinds of students. And I know some of you are also teaching uh, special needs uh, children as well. So often when you have too many distracting elements, uh, they could actually be focusing there rather than the agenda that you might have uh, set up for them. Uh, so the Bitmoji classroom is quite uh, handy. Um, uh, both in a synchronous as well as an asynchronous uh, setup. Um, you know, whether you want to, uh, you know, like for example, in primary school, you probably don't have classes, uh, online classes with them every day, uh, but you want to send them a little nugget uh, to uh, uh, go through uh, on a daily basis. Uh, so a Bitmoji classroom is, uh, a, a, uh, I think an excellent way of uh, doing that. Uh, you've got some visual thing going on and you've got your hype, uh, hyperlinks and you can, uh, you know, take them uh, further with that. Uh, right, so uh, today's agenda was uh, creating an interactive classroom, uh, which uh, Tracy beautifully showed us uh, through Seesaw. Seesaw is, uh, is an amazing tool. I have, uh, you know, explored that, though I'm not using it with my high school students. We do other things, uh, but definitely Seesaw is an amazing tool for primary and middle school teachers. You can even use it for high school. There's no reason um, why you can't. These are all tools uh, that are open-ended. Uh, so uh, they can transcend subjects, uh, they can transcend, uh, you know, grades. Uh, uh, I would recommend this, uh, though, for uh, higher education, though, because um, the interface is, uh, you know, designed for younger uh, audiences. So let's look at a game. Uh, this is also one of the ways in which you can, uh, you know, make an interactive uh, class. Um, so I'm going to just take you there. Um, I think uh, Pallavi will be sharing uh, this slide deck with you later. So the links are there as well. So you can go in and explore them on your own. So I'll just take you into a board game. Um, now this uh, template was created by Slidemania, slidesmania.com. Uh, it's a single person's uh, effort. She's actually working in the finance sector. This is not even her profession, but she just does it out of passion. So if you just go into slidesmania.com, uh, you will find uh, dozens of amazing templates that you can use for your students. So this one is the board game template. 
Uh, so I will want some volunteers uh, for this. And Pallavi, if you could just keep an eye on the chat and uh, uh, we can have about five or six um, volunteers uh, who will ask me one by one to roll the dice. And wherever the dice falls, uh, we are going to stop at that um, uh, uh, you know, number on the board. And uh, then we'll see where we go from there, All right? So, okay, who's the first one, Pallavi? Uh, I'm not able to see the... We have Varsha first. Okay, Varsha, so do unmute yourself. And uh, the moment you give me the go ahead, I'm gonna roll the dice. So I'm just gonna first demonstrate how this will go. So I'm just gonna click on this. Um, and when you say stop, I'm gonna pause the video and wherever it stops. So if this stops at the count of five, I'm gonna go and click on number five and then we're gonna take up what comes uh, to us there. So Varsha, uh, if you're ready, so just okay. unmute yourself and give me a start and a stop. Start. Stop. Okay, so you get a six, right? Let's see, Varsha, what comes your way. So I'm gonna click Varsha. on this little box. And these are all questions which I had taken up from um, you know, the, the question bank that was uh, uh, shared by Pallavi and her team. And these are all your questions. Uh, so the question here is using tech with security measures and also providing teacher insight into the student's activity done from an FA perspective. I think by FA, you mean formative assessment. Uh, right, so how can teachers, if they're using tech tools, get an insight into student activity? So Seesaw is one powerful way of doing that. Uh, there are so many other apps like Flipgrid, you can do it within Google Classroom, or if you're using uh, Teams, you can set up your activities as assignments and see the progress of the students as they're going through uh, with uh, those activities, right? Um, so there, there's actually no end to what you can do with the uh, uh, you know, digital tools and keep an eye uh, on what the students are doing in real time, give them feedback in a real time. Okay, can we have the next volunteer? Deepika. Whoops, I just need to go back to my... That cross is not showing up. Usually the cross shows up there, yeah. Uh, yes, Deepika. So um, can you unmute yourself and give me a start and a stop time? Yes, ma'am. Start. Stop. Okay, so you get the number three. So we're gonna click on number three. And yes, again, uh, I know mathematics teachers often struggle with the digital tools, uh, especially in an online environment. How can we make maths classroom interactive? for learners, which all resources can we use? So if I just click on this back end of the card, uh, there are three, uh, two very, uh, very powerful uh, tools which are meant specifically for mathematics. So that's Desmos and GeoGebra. I'm, I'm sure many of the math teachers have heard of it. If you haven't, uh, now is the time to go and explore both these tools. Uh, very, very powerful uh, vi maths visualizing tools uh, for explaining certain mathematical concepts. Uh, you know, they come embedded with graphs. Um, you can use it for quadratic equations. Quadratic equations, I hated when I was a kid. I just wish that these tools were there when I was learning maths uh, at school. And uh, uh, I probably would have been a maths teacher if not a history teacher by then. And Edpuzzle is again, another powerful open-ended tool open to any subject group. And what you can do with Edpuzzle is embed videos, whether it's from Khan Academy or YouTube uh, or any other channel, um, you know, uh, which perhaps specifically deals with mathematical concepts. Uh, you know, uh, include that into your ed puzzle, um, trim the video, delete certain portions from the video, even from the middle, and then insert your own questions as well. So after, a, after the students have uh, watched a certain section of the video, uh, the video just pauses where you put a question and the students answer that question based on what they've just seen and then move on. So it can be a learning reinforcement. It can be used for introducing new concepts or even for testing. Uh, because uh, uh, Edpuzzle has a very powerful um, analytical center as well. So you get a lot of the analysis of uh, uh, the student performance. Um, you know, how much of the video have they watched? Uh, you know, how much time they've taken to answer certain questions. So even that. So as a math teacher, you can immediately identify if a child is struggling with certain part of a concept or the entire concept as a whole. And then you can look at, you know, diagnostic uh, teaching as well. So uh, we'll just take one more volunteer. Right, our last one is Smita. Smita, over to you. Okay, I'm just going to, just give me a second. I'll, let's 
extend the screen so I can see what's going on. I can't see the other corner. Oops. I'll just go back to slide one. Right. Uh, Smita, did you say Pallavi? Yes. So Smita yeah, so, is now able to speak. Uh, Sanchita, we yes. can't see your screen anymore, though. Oops, I might have just by mistake. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it should come back on now. Yes. Great. Yes. So Smita, give me a start and a stop time. Okay. Start. Stop. Okay, we're back at six. Should we do that again? Because uh, six has been taken already. Start. Stop. Okay, number three. Did we do number three already? Yes, no. Yes, ma'am. Oh, we did. Oh, we have. So once more. Start. Stop. Oops, three again. I'm going to start. Now give me a stop. Stop. Two. two. All right. We go to two. Thank you, Smita. <laughs> Thanks, Smita. Yeah. And uh, how to make online sessions more interesting for children. I think we are actually uh, doing that session today uh, itself, especially when you're looking at younger children. Tracy has shared some very important tips. Uh, and uh, I'm going to be talking more in terms of middle and high school, though uh, what uh, we're going to do next uh, will be can be applicable for the younger uh, students as well. Um, so what you can do here is you can have, uh, you know, you can divide your class into two teams or four teams and you can play this as uh, you know, uh, a board game. This can be used for concept uh, introduction, that what do they know about a concept? And each of these little tiles that we have, uh, you know, you can embed a question within them. Uh, and this is how it comes out. Uh, the link uh, that will be shared in uh, my slide deck as well, it has the template as well. So just go into the template, have a look and set up for your next class and wow your students. Uh, and as you can see that this can, uh, this does have the potential to really engage your students in a fun manner. Uh, I did see some people mentioning in the chat that they were looking, uh, you know, for some, um, you know, uh, if you can inject some fun into your lessons, uh, that also helps with, uh, you know, uh, retention of uh, new concepts being learned. Right. So coming back into our uh, agenda for the day, I've also hyperlinked the hyperdoc. Of course, I'm going to take you straight there. And hang on a moment. Yep. I'm going to copy the link and put it in the chat. Okay, this sort of messes it up a little bit. Um, okay, my chat box seems to have disappeared. <laughs> uh, I think I want to stop sharing for a bit, put it in the chat and then share my screen again. For some reason I'm unable to, um, yeah. So I've just put the link in the chat. It'll prompt you to make a copy. So once you make the copy, you should reach something like this. And I've designed it for educators. I know uh, a lot of teachers have been sharing with me how stressed they are. I'm stressed as well. Uh, so I thought it would be nice if I could put together a hyperdoc uh, for self-care for educators. Now, what's a hyperdoc? Um, hyperdoc is uh, any digital document or a set of slides uh, which has um, you know, various um, uh, hooks uh, which are embedded as uh, links uh, where the students can move outside of that document or that set of slides, uh, explore around uh, and then come back into the uh, main document and put down their thoughts. So HyperDoc was created by a trio of teachers, uh, Lisa Heifel, um, Kelly Hilton and Sarah Landis. Um, Amazing, again, three rock stars of the EdTech world, of the teacher world as well. Again, they're very active on Twitter. So uh, just go ahead and, uh, you know, work uh, with them there. Um, right. Uh, if you're unable to access it, don't worry. The link will be there in uh, uh, the presentation that is, uh, that will be shared with you uh, shortly. Uh, and you can. Uh, I think uh, the participants would need uh, if you could just tell them how they can access it because everybody seems to say that. Yeah, I, I'm getting that as well. My phone was buzzing away. <laughs> so um, hang on. What I will do is uh, let me just pick this up. And I'm going to stop sharing again because for some reason I'm unable to. Right. This should work. Okay. This link should work. Let me just. 
yeah i hope it, this is working now they be prompted to make a copy right uh you should be seeing something like this a uh, copy document make a copy uh, palavi just try it and tell me that's working for you uh still not working i think in your if in your sharing settings if you could just uh, share that with everybody it may just be okay a what i am going to do is right just give me a sec um so as of now i'm going to give you a uh, viewing rights because otherwise my template is going to uh change right but uh, the link to this i will be uh, so what we'll do palavi is we'll check the link from the pdf that you'll be sharing uh, with the participants absolutely uh, right so as of now you should be getting um okay if you try the link again the first link that i had shared uh that should give you viewing rights so i can see already some people are um taking a look right so we were talking about the three uh, rock stars of uh, hyperdoc and uh, it it sounds very intimidating but it isn't really um it's it's really a lesson packaging format uh, both in um uh, whether it it can be used both in a synchronous and an asynchronous manner and again uh, here uh, what uh, the three ladies did was they used the five e's model and added a few more of their own right so five e's of lesson planning uh, so when you're looking at engage explore uh, you know and so on um, uh, and also this uh, you can look at it from a samer model uh, as well uh, i know some of the teachers are already familiar with the samer model and you've been doing stuff i mean uh, everything uh we do we don't always know that that has a name so you've been using the five e's you've been using the samer model um but um, often we don't know the names so when you go back into your uh lesson plans and you look at uh, match them against the five e's or the samer model you will see that you've already been doing uh, all of that so to quickly walk you through uh let's assume that if you were my learners and i was your educator and i've shared this uh, document with you so the first thing that you would be required to do is watch a video and then you would have two short questions that you answer back on this document each student gets their own copy so as a teacher i can also keep track somebody was asking how can we keep track of student work so this is one way of doing that uh then they go on to explore so they look at uh you know a pinterest board uh, which talks about stress and then i've embedded uh, you know a google form uh which helps you figure out your stress levels uh, you can self score yourself there and then we move into something which is you know more direct and you're not just doing it on a digital uh, tool uh, as uh, tracy also earlier pointed out this uh, you know edtech does not mean that you force technology where none is needed right so uh, in this explain stage we could use a tech tool but here i've chosen uh, to you know uh, uh, encourage you to actually talk face to face with a friend or a trusted colleague and you can share uh, what your uh, feelings are and in turn uh, listen to them as well then we move into the apply uh, zone where um, again there's a there's a video the students click on the video link uh, they look at some self care ideas and then you are to create a self care plan for yourself so when it's about your mind what are, what are the de stressing things that you were doing for your mind and what are some of the new ideas that you've uh, come up with perhaps healthier ideas uh, to uh, you know do practice self care for your mind or your body or your feelings relationships work and others i very purposely put to work towards the bottom because only when you got these other four in place that you are truly able to give you 100% at work i hope you all agree with me on that and then share um, again this could be a, a you know you can use technology here i've encouraged you to go on to social media today so whether you're on facebook or twitter or instagram or any other social media channel uh, even if you're in uh, you know whatsapp or telegram groups find that one thing um, that you are grateful for today and talk about that uh, on your social media as well you know we we are not grateful enough i feel uh we don't always count our blessings or look at the gifts that we've been given and we often complaining about what's not right which adds to our stress levels as well uh, so this is again one um, method of self care looking for something to be thankful for and talking about that not just keeping it in your head but probably mentioning it to someone as well because when you say it you make it more real uh and then you have um the reflection part um so you you've got these three questions uh, where um you know you kind of ask yourself what's holding you back from taking care of yourself often it's guilt 
uh, that oh i've not done this for so and so so i don't i've not earned the right to look after myself yet um so you could put that in if that if if that's what your problem is uh unhealthy practices that you want to stop and you know so on you can add more questions if you want here and then for the activity uh your students are uh, you know uh, stressed too so let's extend this hyperdoc activity to perhaps creating a similar hyperdoc or any other set of activity for your students as well uh, often students are not able to verbalize their uh, uh, you know what what's bothering them especially when it uh, when we come to our very young children um it's um they really don't even have the words to express why they're feeling stressed out Uh, so perhaps uh, you know look at uh, some uh, activities for them uh, to uh, do so that it can help them de-stress and look after themselves and you know come to terms with uh, the feelings that uh, you know are bothering them um i'm so disappointed right now that uh, there were some settings issues but uh, it should uh, get fixed when um, you know uh, we share the links with you at the end of the webinar all right um and uh, as uh, tracy also shared i think uh, we, she, she and i share the love for nearpod and flipgrid very powerful tools again in fact nearpod in itself uh, can become a hyperdoc kind of a situation where you can give them these varied experiences students can uh, record uh, what they are thinking in terms of uh, you know audio and even video um flipgrid again is a very powerful uh, uh, tool for video interactions uh, kahoot and quizzes again uh, if you're looking for formative assessments uh kahoot and uh, quiz uh, quizzes are again very powerful a uh, padlet again for collecting students thoughts padlet uh, is again one of my uh, favorites and i usually recommend google classroom as a home where all of these other things can actually sit and find a place and all of these tools are actually um uh, very easily integrated uh, with google classroom and i think many of them are now integrated also with microsoft teams so those of you using teams uh, you can check these out uh, and their integration with google classroom as well uh, and of course we're going to stay connected you all are stars uh, really um, and uh, covid frontliners um and uh, different ways of staying in touch uh, i'm on twitter Uh, and on instagram uh, try to be active on both as much as i can given the fact that i also have a full time teaching job at school um, i also have a newsletter that uh, you can subscribe to generally nuggets of information something new that has come up uh, maybe i'll focus on a, a particular uh, theme and talk to or talk to you about different tools uh, that can be used for a common uh, kind of goal that if you have uh, i also have a youtube channel uh, for quick tutorials uh, uh where i try to help as many teachers as i can even beyond my uh, my school uh, and of course i am also um a co-leader of the google educator group for delhi ncr uh, uh, please uh, feel free to join us uh, from wherever you are in the world you don't have to be a resident of delhi or ncr we have some events coming up uh, shortly uh, so just to go ahead uh, check out uh, the website i'm just going to um, put the link again and i'm going to stop sharing because for some reason my app isn't working right and you can just uh, go into this uh, link and uh, check out the website uh, uh, you know let us know what you what you need and we'll try and help you as much as we can with that so uh, let's move on to the questions we are kind of running short on time <laughs> so yes. we'll take up the questions pallavi so we thank you so much for that sanjita uh, it was fantastic to see the the board game was super fun uh, and it was also amazing to see how easy bitmoji really is bitmoji is something that uh, a lot of teachers tend to ask us about and it seems like rocket science but thank you for simplifying that so much uh, and also thank you for sharing uh, all of those great tips about designing those hyperdocs using bitmoji which makes it so much more visually yeah. um, interactive for kids as well uh, across ages i suppose All right. So, a couple of questions that came in. Uh, the first one being, and I thought this was particularly useful um, since we're talking about, uh, you know, using a variety of different tech tools. And I'm and I'm and I'm hoping Tracy can jump in on this as well. Um, how do we, uh, when you've got different levels of tech adoption for students, right? Not everybody is on the same page at all times when it comes to using a particular tech tool. How do you manage this in the classroom? So, I think, uh, you know, Tracy, if we start out uh, with you answering that question. uh because a lot of the the younger ones are uh, often first time tech users and you've got various degrees of uh, tech adoption in a primary classroom so how do you cope with that how do you deal with uh, different levels of um, uh, of tech adoption 
Um, so uh, like a, a student, like students have different levels of understanding of technology. Is that, that's sort of what I, I took that question as. Um, first of all, I found that kids are a lot more brave than adults. And so um, they have no trouble just clicking around until they figure out how to do something. Um, it's usually the adults in the room that are a little bit more nervous about it than the kids. Um, and I really do feel like they learn so quickly and easily from one another. Um, you know, I will look over and kind of peer and, and see what one of my uh, friends is doing and, and I can learn quickly. But honestly, I haven't found it to be a problem at all, even with, again, I work with very young learners because they are just so, um, you know, able to just sort of click and explore and learn. Uh, yes, I completely agree with Tracy here. Students are far braver than us. I think we have a greater fear of failure than the students. Uh, and, uh, you know, often we find, you know, when I had first started out with technology myself, uh, and I would often find my students without judging me, they would just, you know, rush ahead and say, ma'am, can I help you with that? Uh, and there was no judgment. And I don't think they ever thought any less of me because uh, at that time that hadn't worked with uh, worked for me or I didn't know where to go, uh, uh, you know, uh, where to go from where I was stuck at. Uh, so yes, uh, and uh, so just uh, sometimes the kids will need scaffolding um, if they're ne completely new to a tool, for example, when you first introduce Seesaw to them or Nearpod to them, um, often these tools are very intuitive. So they don't really have to worry. There's not a much of a learning curve for them. But sometimes the kids do get uh, tend to get stuck, and uh, but that's a pretty rare uh, occurrence. Generally, kids take to uh, tech tools much quicker than us. Yeah, so no fear there. Absolutely, um, and I think Lakshmi has a great add-on question to this, right? Um, I think a lot of us um, are obviously right now because we're remote, thinking about how do we make interaction possible online. Um, but she has a very valid point where she says, okay, it's great that we're using all these tech tools for online activity, but what about social interaction? How do we enable that right now? Um, and also I'm assuming Lakshmi, you possibly also want to understand how do we take some of this interaction back into uh, brick and mortar classrooms when we're back face to face with our kids? So um, Tracy, if you'd like to go first with that. Yeah, um, I mentioned when I was speaking earlier, I do really think just having conversations, um, you know, when you're learning synchronously, you're in a Zoom or a Google Meet or what have you, just having those conversations. Um, I know a lot of my colleagues were using like a breakout room where literally the students just had time to just talk with one another, get to know one another, answer a certain set of questions. Um, and then I think having a platform, we use Seesaw and then we incorporated, there's a little blog feature on Seesaw. So I could push certain pieces of work out to the blog and they could actually view and comment and like um, one another's and they absolutely loved that. So again, just trying to in continue to incorporate that interaction and that community with one another, even though we were, um, we were remote and not in our brick and mortar classroom. Absolutely. Uh, we, have yeah. two more, we have time for just two more very quick questions. Uh, and these have come in, you know, from the participants when they registered. So um, one of this is about um, uh, how is it that, you know, and Sudha would want to ask this, how is it that activities planned uh, in hybrid learning, you know, some of these can get very taxing, um, especially when a lot of this is to do with assessments uh, and interaction um, and assessments during these different types of interactions that we set out. How do we simplify some of this uh, interaction evaluation processes and how do we possibly use tech for doing that? Uh, Sanjita, if you, if you want to take that first. Uh, yeah, uh, so if you've... Uh... Uh, explored um, quizzes in Kahoot. There are a lot of ready quizzes that you can just pick up and just edit them and uh, they're good to go. Uh, Nearpod has a lot of, Nearpod and Seesaw, they again have a lot of uh, free resources within the libraries. Uh, pick them up, modify them to your needs. So that's, you know, uh, this is like a first stepping stone. So when you're first getting familiar with the tool yourself, they're very, very uh, useful. That was my path as well when I was exploring, uh, you know, different tech tools to bring into the classroom. Um, so definitely uh, a lot of these tools and apps that we've talked about today, uh, they already have, uh, you know, a huge library of resources. 
Uh, so look at those. You don't always have to start everything from scratch. And if you're teaching older students, uh, you know, my favorite activity with them is now you are the teacher, you are setting up the test uh, for me. Uh, so make the test as tough as you can. Uh, with, of course, a rider that I'm going to take 10% of the questions of my next assessment from what you've given me, <laughs> right? So, uh, you know, with the older students, you can get them into creator mode as well. So uh, again, uh, very, very, uh, you know, whatever tool you're using, try to see if they have a library already. So Kahoot has that, Quizzes has that, Seesaw and Nearpod have that, they have ready lessons. Uh, just, uh, you, you know, you need to modify that. You know, often I find myself for, for concepts which are wider, for example, if I'm teaching Holocaust, uh, Holocaust remains the same across the world. So I don't even often need to modify anything and I can just, you know, uh, launch that straight away with my, uh, with my class. Absolutely. So repurposing a lot of the existing yeah. assessments uh, is, is a great way forward. Unfortunately, that's all we have time for today. Uh, and I know that uh, quite a lot of uh, the Facebook uh, users had come in and were asking some questions. So I'm going to invite Santita and Tracy uh, to once we wrap up the session today to perhaps pop into the, uh, the Facebook chat and try and answer some of the questions there as well. But uh, participants do please keep your questions coming in and of course you you now have access to Tracy and Sanchita uh, via their social media handles so do continue staying in touch with them and posting your questions uh, out to them on Twitter or Instagram uh, or via their uh, blogs as well and uh, thank you so much for these fantastic questions participants it's great to see how we continue to find new and interesting ways to engage with students, how important it is for us as educators uh, to do that well. And it's, it's always such a pleasure to come in and interact with all of you to see how committed you are uh, to improving learning experiences for your, your students. So please keep that up. Thank you very much, Sanchita and Tracy, both of you for this fabulous session, very interactive, lots of great ideas coming in. Uh, we can't wait to share these uh, resources with everybody. Um, and we hope to continue engaging with you uh, even after the session is over uh, on social media. And uh, teachers, thank you so much. We will now be back next week uh, to talk to you about a topic that has come up very, very frequently in our uh, request a session uh, section, uh, which is about dealing with uh, the challenges that come with uh, teaching special needs students and gifted and talented students. So that's coming up for you next week on the 6th of November. So stay tuned and sign up for that on our website already. Uh, thank you once again for a great session resources and PPTs and all of the session recording coming in your inbox very soon. We look forward to receiving your responses for this session. Tell us what you learned, tell us what you loved, tell us how you're using this in your classrooms. And we look forward to sending you certificates for that. So thanks a lot, everybody, and have a wonderful weekend ahead. Thank you, participants, and thank you, panelists. Bye-bye.